Is everybody welcome? You feel welcome? You feel sharp? <laughs> I think Keith Moore he used to he used to teach healing school at Rama, and he'd start at every class like this. So we're going to start it this way because we need to be sharp, don't we? So. Are you willing to confess that tonight with me? So just say this. I'm sharp. I'm bright. I'm quick. Good looking. Extremely blessed. And I'm a major blessing. Did you know that's why God blesses you? We might talk about that. Amen. I want to talk a little bit about the high calling of God. First, I want to ask you a question. Why did God create man? It's okay. It's okay. I like people that interact. I might learn something. And I'm willing. The Bible says God so loved the world. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 and verse 16, it says that God is love. He is love. Not the phileo, highest human type love, but the agape, supernatural, God kind of love. Kind of like Zoe is the supernatural God kind of life. The way he lives it. And the thing about a love like that, it must have an object. God just needed someone to love. Amen? Think about it. He spent the most of six days just preparing his room for him. So he'd have a place to put him. Amen? In Genesis chapter 2, in verse 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that a man should be alone. He said, I'm going to make him a helper, a compatible helper, one that's meet for him. If you go down to verse 20. Verse 19, God formed all the animals and he brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. So see, he put, he let Adam continue his work, didn't he? How did Adam do that? He spoke just like God spoke. Amen? So Adam gave names to all the cattle and the birds and to every beast of the field. But for Adam himself, there was not found a helper comparable to him. Why? Because not one of those animals was compatible with him. They were the wrong species. So God made him somebody who would be compatible with him, whom they could have full fellowship and know each other. Amen? God had already done this. In Genesis 1 and verse 27. Hey, let's see. Let's start 26. So God said... Son, Holy Spirit, let's make man in our image, in our likeness. In the Message Bible, it says, let's make him God-like. They were as much like God as they could be without being God. They were the correct species for him. And because of that, It was somebody for God to love. And for Adam and Eve, they were there in order to, so they would be able to know him. To know him. 
and to love him. How many of you know that if the statement was ever true, it's true of God when you say, to know me is to love me. I remember one time, probably about eight or ten years ago, it was soon after I went to Ozark Bethel Chapel and there was a little Pentecostal pastor there who was about 85 years old preaching in the Holy Ghost and God hit me upside the head that day. That was the day I was able to begin to know him and I had spent so many years in the world I told Pastor Larry, I said, he, he said that he never got drunk. And I said, well, you should thank me, because I drank your share. <laughs> I know some of us remember those days, and, you know, we killed a lot of brain cells back then, didn't we? You know, sometimes it's a miracle that we can stand here and talk legibly to you. Amen. But God is gracious, full of mercy. And he's a miracle God. Amen? And so, it's a struggle then to come out of the world and to come out of all that stuff. And there were some sins that I struggled with and I just, I just almost couldn't stand it. And God just sat me down one day and he said, Son, just sit back. Take it easy. You only need to do one thing. And he said, you just need to get to know me. He said, if you will just get to know me, he said, you'll love me. You'll fall in love with me. He said, when you love me, he said, you will begin to trust me then. And when you trust me, you'll obey me. Did you know it takes all of that to walk the walk? Amen. That's awesome. Well, God is good. So, they were there to know him, to love him, to fellowship with him. And they had perfect, unbroken fellowship, walked with him in the cool of the day, and to have rule over his creation. To know him. Amen? Talking about the high calling of God. Okay, let's go to Philippians. Chapter 3. I just keep looking for the scripture up there. I thought, well, maybe I won't have to turn all my pages. (laughs) Philippians chapter 3. Sorry, Angie. She's going to put it up in the old King James, and I'm going to kind of try to use the new King James. I'm going to start at verse 7. Now, you understand where Paul's coming from. He said, if anybody could rely on the flesh, it was me. Because he said, I had everything going for me. I was born right. I grew up right. I had the best education under Gamaliel. He was the highest rated teacher of the religion in that day. And he was brought up under his feet. Somebody said that if he was here today, he'd had like three or four PhDs just from his education. He says, he says, uh, I was a Pharisee. I was of the elite the Pharisee denomination. Full of zeal, persecuting the church. (laughs) And he says concerning the law, he said, I was blameless. Amen. I kill those Christians. I'm I'm doing God's work, he thought. Amen. He was deceived. But all of these things that he had going for him, in verse 7, he says, those things that were gained to me, he said, I just count them as lost. For Christ. Indeed, I also count all things a loss 
For what? He's exchanging it for something else. The excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. In other words, I trade all that so I can know Jesus. For whom I suffered the loss of all those things, and I just count them as rubbish or dung, so that I may gain Christ. I lost that to gain Christ. Amen? He got a good deal. Don't you agree? That I might be found in him. I want to be found in Jesus, in Christ. Amen? That's where our whole identity lies. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that, that righteousness, which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Verse 10, he repeats it. He says, so that I may know him. So that I may know him and the power of his resurrection the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I count it as a loss so that I can excel instead in knowing Messiah, that I may know him. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, Paul tells Timothy to fight the good fight of faith. And then he says, lay hold of eternal life. Lay hold in the Greek, it's, it's a form of the word lambano, which is always translated to receive. Believe that you receive. And here, it's a little more accurately translated here. He says, lay hold of eternal life. In other words, lambano means to grab it and take a hold of it. Take possession of it yourself. You know you got to do that to receive? Otherwise, God's just going to pay for the gift and hand it to you, and it can just sit there, or you can lay hold of it. You can possess it. Amen? Like God wanted them to possess the land. So he says, lay hold of, what does he say to lay hold of? Eternal life. So, what is this eternal life thing? Most people think, well, it's living forever. You're going to be eternally there. Yeah, everybody's going to be eternally there. You're going to exist forever. So is every lost person. They're just going to exist in death. And you're going to exist in eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe on him should not perish, but have eternal life. Later on in John chapter 3, it says, he who has Jesus, believes in Jesus, he has eternal life right now. Amen? So you don't even have to wait till you get to heaven to partake and lay hold of eternal life. Where do you think we could get a good definition of eternal life? You know, Jesus was a word crafter. He knew how to use words effectively. And so if you can see a definition in red letters, I'd say that's a pretty good place to look, don't you? So we got, let's go to John chapter 17. The Lord's Prayer. In verse 3, Jesus said, Bill knows this so well, this is eternal life. Okay, here's what it is. You want to know what eternal life is? Here it is that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's eternal life. To know him.
There was a news article one time of a lady that she was out looking for her birth father, whom she had never met. She lost her daddy. And by the time she was 30 years old, she actually tracked him down. And so she got to go meet him. And, of course, she was just tickled. She got to love her daddy now that she never knew before. And she quoted in that news article, she said, I spent the first 30 years so that I could meet my father. Listen to this. Are you sharp tonight? So I could meet my father. I'm going to spend the next 30 years getting to know my father. Because I don't know him yet. I met him. And it's so easy for people to say, oh yeah, I know Jesus. You know what I'm saying? It's easy to say that, isn't it? Well, you know, there's a reason that James said to be slow to speak and quick to listen. I have learned that. And I find out a lot of things by just not saying anything for a while. I find out a lot of things. Somebody may say, I know the Lord. Yep. Amen. So we get to spend the rest of our life getting to know the Father. Amen? Let's go to 1 John. In the very first chapter. Now remember in, in John's gospel, the first chapter, it says in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen? In his letter, he starts out real similar to that. He says, that which was from the beginning, in the beginning was the Word. Amen? Which we have heard, we've heard this Word, and we've seen, because the Word was made flesh, wasn't it? Amen? Our eyes we have looked upon, and our hands have handled him. John used to lean on his breast. Leaning. Leaning on the breast of love. <laughs> Amen? Concerning what? The word of life. That life was manifested. So now, we know a couple things about Jesus. Jesus said that, you know, in Hebrews chapter 10, it says, Lord, a body you have prepared me to go do your will. In John, several times during his gospel, he says, Jesus says, I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of the Father. So everything... Everything Jesus did was the will of God. It's like an acted out promise. Amen? Shall I do that? <laughs> We've got a... Our Bible class, we're actually going through some healing school. Amen? Because uh, God's people need that. And I think that <laughs> we haven't got very far. We kind of start over every week. <laughs> when you have, here's the thing, most Christians, now, disregard because I know this isn't true of anybody here. Most Christians, though, will feed their body three good hot meals a day. And they'll feed their spirit one, maybe two cold snacks a week. 
We talk about this tonight. That's not continuing in the Word. Jesus said, you want to be free, you need to know the truth. To know the truth, you need to continue in the Word. So we get a little bit of time once a week, so we just go back over it again. And then we just tack on a little bit on the end of that, a half a step forward. Amen. Hey, I'm going to know it pretty good. I think it was Charles Spurgeon said, he said, once I've preached a message 50 times, he said, I do it pretty good. <laughs> Amen? Amen? So we start that out with the same statement every week. And this is it. During his ministry on the earth, see, we just talked about that, didn't we? Because he always did the will of the Father. During his ministry on the earth, Jesus revealed to me the express will of the Father for the redemption of the whole man, righteousness for his spirit, peace for his soul, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and healing for the body. It's all in the redemptive chapter in Isaiah 53. Amen. Don't shout me down now just because I'm preaching real good. Amen. So he said, we have handled this guy. This, what is this we handled? The word of life. Amen. That life was manifested and we've seen it. And we bear witness and we declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us in Jesus. Amen. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. Why do we declare these things to you? So that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Amen? That life. And he also said that life, that eternal life, was in him. And that life was the light of the world. The life that he manifested and everything he did in his ministry and taught his disciples to do the same thing. Amen? Boy, that's hard to see. <laughs> Looking out at a distance there. Amen. That our fellowship, we have fellowship with you, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus. That's what happens when we start talking about you can have a glory with the Father in your secret place, but there's also a corporate glory. And if we have time, we'll get to that. John 4. John spoke a lot about love because he knew love. Amen? John chapter 4 and verse 16. And John says, We have known and believed the love. So eternal life is to know the Father and His Son. Now God is love. We have known and believed the love that God has for us because God is love. So he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. Amen? So you fellowship with Father. You get to know Father. You get to know love. Amen? Now let's go back to Philippians. We're going to get there. The high calling of God. Where do we leave off? Verse 10. That I may know Him. If by any means... Verse 11, Philippians 3, 
I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Verse 12, not that I've already attained and not that I'm already perfected. Now, I'll just give you a clue. Paul wasn't perfected yet, so we got a little ways to go. Amen? We might as well just accept that fact. But Paul says, I press on, and this is why, so I can lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Or apprehended, it says, in the King James. So Jesus got a hold of him for a purpose, didn't he? We always talk about it. God's got a purpose for you. Well, he laid a hold of Paul for that purpose. And Paul, his goal is to lay a hold of the reason he got called. I want to get a hold of what Jesus called me for. Amen? Can you understand that? Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Oh, that reminds me when I, I've got a message called One Thing. It's awesome. <laughs> this one thing I do, forgetting those things, all these things that he gave up and he counted as loss and he looks at them as just worthless rubbish. So I forget those things and I reach forward to the things which are ahead and I press Verse 14. Thank you, Angie. I got to read this out of the King James. I press towards the mark for the prize. Okay, so he's pressing towards a mark. That's a target. So he's got a goal. He says, This is my goal, and I'm reaching out for it, and I'm going to get a hold of that prize. His goal is to get a hold of the prize. And here's the prize, he said, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So he is reaching out to apprehend that which Jesus caught a hold of him for. And he's reaching forth for his goal, which is the prize, which is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Amen? You got that? Okay, now, I want to go back to Galatians. Jesus called me. And he called you. And he called Paul. And Paul's figuring out why. Amen? Galatians chapter 1. In verse 15... When it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb. Psalm 139 says that... Excuse me? <laughs> he knew us well, we were, before we were in the womb, actually. And he wrote down... All of the things. He wrote down our whole life. He had it all set out for us. And wrote it in a book, he said. Amen? So I guess in Revelation it says he opens the book of life. Then it says he opens the books. He got your life written down in a book. I think we get to compare it, what we did, with what it says. That's just me. So he says, it pleased God who called me from my mother's womb, separated me, and called me through his grace. So what did he call me for? Verse 16. To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles. So he had a purpose, to reveal Jesus in in him. He says, no longer I that live. It's Christ in me. 
In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. Amen? To reveal Jesus in me. In Genesis 12, 2, God called Abraham out. He said, come out from among your kin and go here where I'm going to show you where to go. And he says, I'm going to bless you. And I'm going to make you a blessing. Remember our confession? I'm a major blessing. Amen. So he blesses us to be a blessing. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 8, Jesus sent out his disciples to do the same thing he was doing. Which was preaching the gospel, saying the kingdom has come to you today. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils. Freely you have received, freely give. So we receive from God to freely give. In fact, he says, you know, in Ephesians 4, those who steal, steal no more. But work with your hands so that you have that which to give to him who needs. So, now this would be a good giving message, Sharon. Amen? You don't work, <laughs> you don't work to meet your needs. God says, I will meet your needs according to my riches and glory. You work to have something to give to somebody who needs it. And then you trust God. Amen? <sighs> We were talking about faith today. Faith in the word, meditating the word till you believe it and then enough to act upon it. Amen. Romans 8. In verse 29. I'm racing Angie. My pages are sticking together again. Wait a minute. Romans 8, 29. It says that whom he, who God foreknew, he predestined for what? To be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Formed conformed into his image. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus himself was the express image of the Father. In fact, in John 14.9, Jesus told Philip, he said, listen, Philip, you don't know me yet? He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Because he looks just like me and what I've been doing. Amen? So if we get to be conformed to the image of Jesus here's one time I'll let you use your reasoning if you want a miracle you can't use your reasoning okay because miracles are not reasonable but if Jesus is the express image of the Father and we are conformed into the image of Jesus to look just like him then what does that make us that makes us the spitting image of our Father Amen? 2 Corinthians. Quit it, Bill. You're, you're going to lose your gold star. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 18. We all, with unveiled face, the veil was put over their eyes, Paul says here, so that they can't see. They can't see the gospel. They can't see the good news. So we, with unveiled face, Beholding, as in a mirror, what are we beholding? What are we looking at? The glory of the Lord. And we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory. 
This is a product of your secret place between you and the Lord and His Word. Beholding as in a mirror is not necessarily what God has actually made you to be, but it's what you perceive that you are able to see and receive revelation of who you are in Christ. You know that's kind of important. Amen? When you receive that revelation by the Spirit of God, the veil is taken away. So you're beholding the glory of God like in a mirror. Now, I didn't write this down, but we need to go back to James chapter 1 <clears throat> because he talks about the same thing here. Verse 22, he, James says, Be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. So you've got to receive the word. Oh boy, you know, we could get into a lot of stuff here. Just the, the very basic beginning foundations that Jesus began to ta teach when he taught the parable of the sower in the Gospel of Mark. And they said, oh, explain this to us. And he says, listen, if you don't get this, this is kingdom of heaven 101. If you don't get this, you're not going to get any of them. So you got to get this. And he talked about planting the seed in the different kinds of soil. You understand there's four kinds of soil. The first three didn't have any fruit at all. None of them. So there's only one choice. Amen. Then another little parable right after that in Mark chapter 4, it says a farmer went out and he cast seed into the ground. And he said then he, he went to bed and he got up every day and that seed sprouted up and he didn't know how. Miracles are not reasonable. He didn't know how it happened. You don't have to know how it happened. You need to have faith in God, right? And he says it'll come up first the leaf, then the head, the fruit in the head, and then it'll ripen and harvest is ready. So see, faith is a process. So you've got to continue in the word. I'll just repeat that. Okay, so he says, be doers of the word, not hearers only. Then when you, you plant that seed and you water it and you meditate on that word and you get to where you actually believe it, then you get to act on it. Verse 22, if anyone is a hearer of the word but not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself and then he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. Okay, do you remember the parable of the sower? The sower sows the seed. And immediately the devil comes and steals the seed, the word, out of their heart. He doesn't know how it comes up because the earth, the soil, will bring forth fruit of itself. The heart will bring forth fruit of itself. Faith fruit. We're talking about faith farmers. Amen? So, when that word gets stolen, he forgets what kind of man he was. He forgets what he saw in the word. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. And one of the big secrets is in verse 26. If anyone among you thinks he's religious, but he doesn't bridle his tongue. He deceives his own heart, and his religion is useless. Got to learn how to speak, too, don't we? <laughs> if you agree with the word... That's why Paul calls out the word of faith in my heart and in my mouth. Amen? So Jesus taught, he said, now, don't pray like these, this Pharisee denomination who likes to stand out and pray loud. I always like to think of the one in Luke 18 where you got the Pharisee and you got the sinner and, and, the, and the Bible says... And this was Jesus speaking. He says, this Pharisee got up and he prayed thus with himself. He wasn't even praying to God. He was praying to himself. He was praising himself. He says, God, I thank you. I'm not like anybody else. I'm perfect. 
Amen. He said, don't pray like that. He says, but you go get in your secret place, your little room, and then close the door. And he says, your father, who is, by the way, in the secret place, where's he at? He's in the secret place. He'll hear in secret. So you take the word in there. You want to behold the glory of God? There's a good place to do it. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 in verse 6. Just think, I only have to turn one page. Not even that. For it is God who did what? He commanded the light to shine out of darkness. So when people tell us the Hebrew in Genesis chapter 1 says, light be, this confirms that. Jesus commanded the light to be. He commanded the light to shine out of that darkness. And this is the same God who has shown in our hearts to give the light, the revelation to know the glory of God. We're at in the face of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite little scriptures out of Psalms is Psalm 1715. Where he says, as for me, I will behold your face in righteousness. And I'll be satisfied when I awake with your likeness. Thank God. Righteousness is a gift, yeah. right? And that's why Paul says, and Hebrews tells you a couple of times, just by the blood of Jesus, enter boldly into that holy of holies where the presence of God is in your secret place. Amen. And behold his face in that gift of righteousness that he's given us. Amen. And I'll be satisfied when I look just like you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. That's beholding the glory in the secret place. But there's a corporate glory. Amen? Yes. This is kind of what everybody's looking for nowadays because it brings awakening and revival. Amen? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Verse 24, let us consider one another in order to do what? Stir up love and good works. Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. If you want to be in the corporate glory, you want to be here, don't you think? I'm, one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 133. And it kind of makes this pretty plain. Psalm 133. Oh, Angie, you're so fast all of a sudden. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Amen? One heart, one mind, one spirit. He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. Amen? If you're joined to the Lord, you're one spirit with Him. If you're joined to the Lord, what do you think, Bill? You're one spirit with Him. If I'm joined to the Lord, I'm one spirit with Him. That puts us automatically one spirit. One spirit. Unity. You believe that? Act like it. Amen? Amen. Be a doer. <laughs> Amen. Okay. Verse 2. It, this is like the precious oil upon the head running down the beard, the beard of Aaron, running down the edge of his garments. Talking about the anointing oil that the priest was anointed with. Now, what is that a type of? The anointing oil. Do you remember... 1 Samuel chapter 10, 
when Samuel went to Saul, King Saul, and it says he took the oil and he poured that oil on him. He anointed him just like he did with Aaron here. He anointed him with that oil. And then he said this. He said, is it not because God has anointed you that I pour this oil on? What did God anoint him with? I'm probably going to have to go there. What did God anoint him with? Did I hear somebody say something? He says, is it not because the Lord has anointed you that I'm pouring this oil on you? And then he says, here's what's going to happen. When you leave me today, you're going to find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin. This is, this is comparable to a word of knowledge nowadays. Look how detailed this thing is. When the prophet speaks to him in Zelza, and they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for, because his dad lost his donkeys. <laughs> now your father ceased to care about the donkeys, and he's worrying about you. What shall I do about my son? Well, you go forward from there, and you come to a terebinth tree of Tabor. Three men going up to God at Bethel will meet you there. One's going to carry three young goats. Another's going to carry three loaves of bread. Another carrying a skin of wine. That's pretty detailed. They'll greet you, and they'll give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. After that... You'll come to the hill of God, where the Philistine garrison is. And it will happen, or it shall come to pass. When you have come there to the city, that you will meet a group of prophets now, coming down from the high place with a stringed instrument, a tambourine, a flute, and a harp before them, and they will be prophesying. Then, he says, at that point in time, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. You will prophesy with them and you'll be turned into a whole nother man. So he was anointing him with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, Psalms 133. <laughs> I think the computer went to sleep. Okay, there it is. So it's like this precious oil. Okay, so he's talking about the anointing of the Holy Spirit. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Amen? So it's like that. What's it doing? It's running down from the head. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. Jesus was set at the right hand of the Father and he was made to be the head to the church, which is his body. And this oil is running right on down from the head to the body. Amen? The anointing of the Holy Spirit, because how good and how pleasant it is for men to dwell together in unity. Amen. Talking about the corporate anointing, the corporate glory. Amen? Verse 3. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountains of Zion. So here you got the dew and the rain up on the mountains and they'll form little rivulets and run down the mountain into the streams and end up in the river. It feeds the Jordan River. Amen? So he's talking here about rivers of living water, which Jesus would tell us about in John chapter 7. The anointing, the corporate glory the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the rivers of living water. Amen? For there, it is there, the Lord commanded the blessing. And what is that? Life everlasting. Amen? So how many of you think, well, I think it would be a good idea to get to know God, to get to know my Father. I, you know, I'm ready to see some of these things. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. 
Do you expect it? Do, do you come in here expecting it when you arrive? I know a couple people who do. What's, what do you think is going to happen when everybody expects it? Faith is the substance of things you totally expect and anticipate. Amen? Is that, does that sound like an angel to you? <laughs> Amen. So, this is just something that simply, it's a hard commitment with an individual beginning that way. If everybody goes home and beholds the glory of God, I will behold your face in righteousness. In his own secret place, listen, God will meet you there. You believe that? Yes. Oh, what are you going to do then tonight or tomorrow morning? Amen? Just say, you can get filled with the Holy Spirit right there. Yes. You do understand that on the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, and then they went out and preached. And they added 3,000. Well, that was the beginning of the church there. A couple of days later, there's another 5,000. And then... They arrested him. They're going to whoop up on him some, command him, don't talk in Jesus' name anymore. So they went out and prayed. They got together and they prayed and said, Lord, look at this, what they're picking on us. <laughs> they say, Lord, make them stop it. <laughs> no, they counted themselves actually blessed that they were worthy to be persecuted for his name's sake. Paul said, if you're going to live a godly life, you're going to be persecuted. Amen. So they said instead, Lord, grant us boldness that we can speak your word by you doing your part and stretching forth your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done by the, in the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And then it says that building they were praying in just got shook, got all shook up. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. Amen? You can be filled again. And again, wouldn't that be exciting? What do you think is going to happen if you come in here on Sunday morning all filled with the Holy Ghost? Think that'll help the unity? Hey, Lord, we're ready. Up to you to make that commitment. Amen? How many of you are going to go seek God? I'm going in the sacred place. The Bible says the Father is in the sacred place. That means he said, you know, oh, man. Excuse me. Thank you, Lord. Okay. If you think you need to just step forward, I don't think you need anybody to lay hands on you. It's not here to lay hands on you and fill you with the Holy Spirit. This is for your commitment between you and Jesus, you and the Father, to meet him in the secret place where he says he's waiting on you. The Bible says we need to wait on the Lord. He that waits on the Lord shall renew his strength. Amen? Well, see, he's waiting on us. He's waiting right there in the secret place. If any of you feel like that's something that I, I want to make that commitment between me and Jesus tonight. You can do it right there where you're at. You can come up here. And if you want somebody to pray with you, we're glad to do that. We got Tammy and Sharon and Chris. There's people to pray with you. So, Father, I thank you. Oh, Holy Father. Thank you, Lord. I'm thanking you, Lord, because I know this is what you wanted to say tonight. And it isn't just for these here, but it is for them and for me. So, Lord, we want to set our hearts, we want to set our face like flint and commit to you, Lord, to meet with you where you're waiting for us in the secret place, that we can begin to be the ones to minister to you and wait upon you
and behold your face in righteousness, that we might be changed into your image and walk out in the glory of our Father. I say so be it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys.